Good morning. Welcome to Greenhurst Bible Church online service. Today, of course, is June 21, 2020. And of course, we want to wish everybody a happy Father's Day today. And on top of that, I got a little video to share with you at this particular time. No matter how old we are, we always remember what our dads say and do. My dad is more like Jesus than your dad. Nuh-uh. My dad doesn't let anybody eat any food until we pray for it. My dad prays for one minute every day. You know what? Our church has pancakes. This is what my sister and mom use for their blush. My dad says that mean kids never know what they're talking about. Because their parents don't know what they're talking about either. My dad says to punch meanies in the face. Then my mom says, don't ever do that. And my dad goes to time out. <laughs> <laughs> my dad's beard is itchy whenever he kisses me. My dad takes me to church so we could learn to be just like Jesus. My daddy prays for me. Then he makes me stop talking and go to bed. Then I get a flashlight and read my comic book. That's a sin. He's sinning. No, I'm not. Sinner. No, I'm not. R2. 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 My dad said that if you don't have anything nice to say, don't say it. My dad never stays mad at me. My dad taught me to forgive, because Jesus forgives us every time we ask. I want a mohawk. I wish I had hair. It's OK. Your hair will probably grow back. Thanks for being our dads for all our lives. Well, if you are in Sunday school, you should be on uh, less in Revelation. We'll be in Lesson 48, dated May 24, 2020. And you should be reading Revelation chapter 16 as we get into that. If you, of course, are in Bible study, we are now in Lesson number 22, that means you should be reading this week Job 1 through 22, Psalms 143 through 6, and Proverbs 23 through 29. And if I were you, I might read all of Job at once. It kind of helps you to uh, get the whole better picture of it on, on what's going on. As for announcements... Uh, we're still planning on June 22nd to move back into the sanctuary. Uh, look forward to having open up Sunday school also on that. Uh, Shiloh, of course, the camps are going. And this week, I believe the camps are for uh, uh, 11 and 12 year olds, if I remember right. So if you got young people, uh, make sure you go to ShilohBibleConference.com and look up those camps and get them registered for it for that and I also I have a, a poem that I would like to share with you and let's see if I can find it here and it's called silent strong dad it says he never looks for praises he's never one to boast he just goes on quietly working for those he loves the most his dreams are seldom spoken he wants are very few and most of the time he worries will go unspoken too. He's there, a firm foundation through all our storms of life, a sturdy hand to hold on to in times of stress and strife. A true friend we can turn to when times are good or bad. One of our greatest blessings, the man that we call Dad. And of course, again, we want to wish everybody a happy uh, Father's Day and 
I think Joe has a song he wants to share with us. Thank you, Joe. For our prayer and praises today, we have a couple. Uh, of course, we want to be praying for our nation. As you know, that uh, last night Trump had his rally, and uh, and if you've been listening to the news, you know how much they have been uh, saying how bad this is to have a, a group of people coming together to listen to a rally when they uh, seem to be blessing all the riots that are going on. So we need to be praying for our nation we need to be praying for Israel as, as this date of July 1st is coming closer for them. And of course, we need to be praying for revival in our land, that, our, that these uh, hearts and minds of these people will be opened up and they can really learn and see who God is. And I didn't get any real prayer requests this week from anybody. Uh, I do want to be praying for Betty as she's trying to heal from her uh, 
uh, a sore that she has on her leg. We just want to be keeping her in our prayers as we also go. And I'm sure there are many other requests. I pray for those that are traveling that you keep them safe. So let's go to the Lord in prayer at this time, shall we? Father, we do thank you, Lord. We thank you again for the day that we can all come together. Lord, I pray for every person out there, Lord, as they are searching for you, that you will open up their hearts and allow them to find you, Lord. I pray for our nation and the turmoil that we see in our nation. I pray for our police officers that, and for their safety, Lord, and the support that they need during this time, Lord. I pray also for our president and vice president as they are uh, out there trying to direct this nation in the, the way it should go. And Lord, I do pray for our cities and the turmoil that we see in our cities, Lord, that you will uh, help bring this turmoil to an end. And Lord, we just pray that that you will guide and direct this nation. We pray for a revival in our land, that uh, we once again can turn back to you and see your hand of mercy upon us, Lord. And we pray for the nation of Israel. We pray, Lord, as they prepare to, to uh, annex in parts of the West Bank, Lord, that they will not be the, the, the disruption that uh, the world seems to think it's going to be, Lord. We pray, Lord, for these other nations who are dealing with the famine that's going across them, Lord. We just pray you be with them and uh, allow these locusts to die off and, and uh, allow them to be able to get their crops back because uh, what, a, what a curse it has been for them as they're trying to deal with this, Lord. So we just pray your hand of mercy will be upon them also. And Lord, we just give you the praise and glory as we go into our service. We also pray, Lord, for... Betty, that you will uh, help her to heal quickly. I know she's been struggling this for a long time, so we just pray, Lord, you allow her to heal quickly and, and be able to get back among us. In Jesus' name we pray. And in this time, I'd like Joe to share another song with us.
I really enjoyed that one, Joe. Thank you so much. Well, let's talk about a couple articles that are in the news this week, just to help you along. It says, rumors of war, China and India, North Korea, South Korea, Israel, and Turkey. As if we didn't have enough already going on in 2020, now we are facing the possibility that several regional wars may erupt. China and India are both being uh, have been pouring troops into a disputed border region, and now there's been an incident where they are actually killing each other. And of course, that incident is, is about 20 people that got killed in this process. Uh, North Korea has, claimed, has been, they tell us, has blown up the liaison office. Uh, and it sounds like that they're trying to cause disruption in that area again. And uh, I'm not so sure how that's going. And, of course, the Middle East, we have Turkey responding to uh, Israel and their attempt to do the annexation. So we have a lot we need to keep in our prayers this week as we go through what's going on in our country and there. Also, we got six-week countdown to more economic or social chaos. It says, many of the emergency economic measures that were put into place to support the American people financially throughout this pandemic are about to disappear, and that means that big trouble is on the horizon. Right now, we are in the midst of the deepest economic downturn since the Great Depression of the 1930s. Economic activity has fallen dramatically. More than 100,000 businesses have permanently closed, and more than 44 million Americans have lost a job so far in 2020. But up to this point, up to this point, most Americans are not feeling too much economical pain thanks to the unpresented intervention by the federal government. Unfortunately, <coughs> that short-term boost of artificial relief is about to wear off, and that is going to cause some major problems as we approach the end of this calendar year. But on July 31st, about six weeks from now, that is all going to change. That $600, in, uh, what's it called, unemployment bonus is scheduled to, to come to an end. We're also seeing on top of that that the relief from uh, uh, rent payments, the relief that the banks were told not to foreclose, all of those are going to be coming to an end pretty soon. And all of a sudden, all this economic turmoil that we've been dealing with was starting to come to a head. So unless they come up with another package or something, we're going to be seeing um, more turmoil in the, in the fall coming out. Countdown to election, 133 days as of today. It says Portland police quickly shut down autonomous zone outside, outside mayor's office. And that was Thursday night that it happened. And... So they tried to go to Portland and start an autonomous zone. They thought that they would go to the area where the mayor lives and start one. And what happened? He says, you ain't doing that in my city. And he shut it down. So that is fantastic. So what's the next turmoil that we're going to expect to happen, you know? We can now that know that from now until election day, that there's going to be something that's going to be happening every day as they try to disrupt this. And, of course, that probably means they're going to try to make a second wave of COVID-19. Then maybe they'll try some more riots. We're not 100% sure. But what we do know is that turmoil will continue throughout the summer. And we need to be praying for that, that that civil unrest will come to an end and, and this and this election will get over with, and we can start moving forward with it. So that's the kind of what's in the news. You guys are hopefully are keeping up with all of it, so it's not like I need to tell you everything going on. But it, it's, you know, as we have stayed home through this pandemic, what we've had is an opportunity to finally spend some time and look up these news articles and find other sources to get us our information so that we can get both sides of the story and try to find out what is true. Uh, a lot of times the side that we hear 
is only one-sided. And in order to make an informed decision, you need to know both sides of the story and what's truly going on. And of course, these police officers are struggling that with right now as, as we only get to see one side of that story. And we have to wait for them to actually go to trial and let the jury decide what really happened there and not have the public making these decisions and condemning these people before they even get a chance to go to trial. So that's kind of where we're at. Our sermon today we're going to talk about is Why Me? Uh, we're going to be looking into the book of Job, uh, particularly from uh, his life and what happened to him in there. So our scripture reading is from Job 1. 13 through 22. So if you've got your Bible and you want to join me and open up to it, we'll get a chance to read through that. And it starts out like this. Now there was a, we're starting at verse 13. So Job 1, 13 through 22. It says, Now there was a day when his sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And a messenger came to Job and said, the oxen were plowing, the donkeys feeding beside them, when the Sabines raided them and took them away. Indeed, they have killed the servants with the edge of the sword, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The fire of God fell from heaven and burned up the sheep and the servants and consumed them, and I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, The Chaldeans formed three bands, raided the camels and took them away. Yes, and killed the servants with the edge of the sword. And I alone have escaped to tell you. While he was still speaking, another also came and said, Your sons and daughters were eating and drinking wine in their oldest brother's house. And suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness and struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you. Then Job rose, tore his, rose, tore his robe, and shaved his head, and he fell on the ground and worshipped, and he said, Naked I come from my father's womb, and naked shall I return there. The Lord gave, and the Lord has taken away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. And in all this, Job did not sin nor charge God with wrong. Let's open in a word of prayer, shall we? Father, we do thank you for your word. As we look at this scripture reading, we find what a tragedy has struck Job at, all at once. Not only has all of his possessions been taken or destroyed, his children have also lost their lives. And all this has been brought to him at one, Lord. But, but as we look into his life, we give you the praise and glory as we uh, look at this to understand that in all that, God didn't blame you. You know, he still gave you the glory. So Lord, we just pray that you will help us to understand that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Well, let's start at the beginning. Who is this man, Job, first of all? You know, we don't really know when the book of Job was written. We don't have an exact date. We don't know if it was written during the time of, of Abraham. We don't know if it was written during the time of Jacob. We really don't know. All we know is we get to hear of an incident. It tells us that he came from the land of Uz, but we don't really know where Uz was. You know, some people think it was in the bottom part of Israel. Some people think it was in the top of Israel. Some people think it was a different part altogether. We don't know, but Job 1.1 starts to give us an explanation of who this man is that we're about to talk about. It says, there was a man in the land of Uz whose name was Job, and that man was blameless and upright, and one who feared God and shunned evil. He also, as we look at him, we know that the place where he lived was a fertile land. 
We find that out in Job 1.3. And we also know that he was near the desert, because in our scripture reading we read it as being the wilderness. So when you read Job 1.3, this is what we find out. Also his possessions were 7,000 sheep, 3,000 camels, camels, 500 yoke of oxen, 500 female donkeys, and a very large household. And so that this man was the greatest of all the people of the East. So this gives you an eye how powerful this man is and how wealthy of a man this is. Verse 19 had told us, and suddenly a great wind came from across the wilderness. And we know that when they say wilderness, they generally mean from across the desert. So we know that the fertile land that he lived in was next to a desert. And struck the four corners of the house, and it fell on the young people, and they are dead, and I alone have escaped to tell you on it. So what else do we know about this man Job? Well, we know he was highly respected. We know that because in Job 29, 7-11, we read this. It says, When I went out to the gate by the city, when I took my seat in the open square, the young men saw me and hid, and the aged arose and stood. The princes restrained from talking and put their hand on their mouth. The voice of nobles was hushed, and their tongue struck, stuck to the, top, to the roof of their mouth. When the ear heard, then it blessed me, and when the eye saw, then it approved me. So what do we know about him? We know that he was a very respected man. He went to the front, to the gates. That means that's where he listened to the people's problems. He gave them wise advice on what they needed to do. And we also know that when you ver read ver Job 29, 12 through 17, that he was a fair and honest judge. It says, Because I delivered the poor who cried out, the fatherless, and the one who had no helper, the blessing of a perishing man came upon me, and I caused the widow's heart to sing for joy. I put on righteousness, and it clothed me. My justice is like a robe and a turban. I was eyes to the blind, and I was feet to the lame. I was a father to the poor, and I searched out the case that I did not know, broke the fangs of the wicked, and plucked the victim from his teeth. So what do we know about him? He fairly judged each case that come to him. And if he didn't understand the case, he went and found out before he made his decision. He was there. He was a wise man. And the people respected him very much. We also know that he was a wise counselor. We know that because of Job 29, 21 through 24. He says, Men listened to me and waited and kept silence for my counsel. After my words, they did not speak again, and my speech settled on them as dew. They waited for me as for the rain, and they opened their mouth wide as for the spring rain. If I mocked at them, they did not believe it, and the light of my countenance they did not cast down. So that gives you just an idea. Now, as you read Job, you're also going to find out that he was an honest employer. You see that in verses 13 through 15 in chapter 31. He was hostile and generous. You will find that in chapter 31, 16 to 21. And he was a farmer of crops also. And of course, we'll find that in chapter 31 also. So overall, Job was a good and righteous man. Well respected in his community and surrounding countryside. Everybody appreciated Job for who he was. So this is not the type of person we, all, we should not attempt to be. I should say, is this not the type of person we should attempt to be? You know, it should be us who helps our neighbors in times of need. You know, we should be generous and hospitable. Everything we read about Job, this should be who we are. You know, we should not be... Uh, reading our Bible and then not understanding what it says. We should be taking the time to read it. We should be taking the time to pray. We should even try to learn a verse or two from time to time. 
And we need to even learn how to volunteer in our church from time to time. All these are things that we know that Job would teach us as we read through the book of Job on that. But then we have an issue that comes up. What do we see in here? All of a sudden, Job has a, things are falling apart for him and he doesn't understand why they're falling apart. But we get inside of that when we look into uh, Job chapter 1, 6 through 12. We start to get an insight of what is going on in heaven that is affecting Job down here on earth. And it says, Now there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan also came among them. And of course, the sons of gods, as they're referring to here, it would be God's angels, his faithful angels at this time. And of course, Satan, we all know who Satan is, and he has, at this time, access to God. He, go, he goes up to God. And the Lord said to Satan, from where did you come? So Satan answered, the Lord said, from going to and forth on the earth and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, have you considered my servant Job, that there is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil? So God brings up to Satan Job, have you considered him? Well, Satan's going to take this opportunity, of course, if God brings it up. There must be something here, right? So Satan answered the Lord and says, Does Job fear God for nothing? You know, Satan knew who Job was. Have you not made a hedge around him, around his household, and around all that he has on every side? You have blessed the work of his hands and his possessions have increased in the land. But now, stretch out your hand and touch all that he has, and he will surely curse you to your face. What's God doing? He's given an opportunity for Satan to see that man can still be faithful to him, even in the middle of his adversities. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, all that he has is in your power, only do not lay a hand on this person. Person. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord. And now we know what happened, don't we? We know that Satan came down, allowed his, all of his sheep to be destroyed, his camels, uh, everything that he had, even killed his children off. I mean, this is a dramatic effect to put on one man all at once. But in the whole process, Job did not curse God for it. In the whole process... Well, Job goes back up to God, and what do we find out? Job says, well, he survived that. He didn't curse you. So then we read this in Job chapter 2, verse 1. It says, again, there was a day when the sons of God came to present themselves before the Lord, and Satan came also among them to present himself before the Lord. And the Lord said to Satan, from where did you come from? Satan answered the Lord and said, From going back and forth on the earth, and from walking back and forth on it. Then the Lord said to Satan, Have you considered my servant Job? There is none like him on the earth, a blameless and upright man, one who fears God and shuns evil. And still he holds fast to his integrity, although you cited me against him, to destroy him without cause. So see, in spite of everything that has happened to Job at this time, Job has been faithful to God, and Satan sees that. So what Satan say to God? He says this, So Satan answered the Lord and said, Skin for skin, yes, all that a man has he will give for his life. But stretch out your hand now and touch his bone and his flesh, and he will surely curse you to your face. And the Lord said to Satan, Behold, he is in your hand, but spare his life. So Satan went out from the presence of the Lord and struck Job with painful 
boils from the sole of his feet to the crown of his head. So it's bad enough that he's lost his possessions and he's lost his children. Now the test that comes to him is his health. Something that is always near and dear to all of us, isn't it, is our health. You know, we can deal with a lot of other problems, but when it comes to our health, it's something we take very personal. You remember his wife? Even his wife, who saw Job in all this pain that he was going through. What happened to poor Job? He's got these boils all over his body. He's outside the city. He's in the ashes. He's trying to recover from this, but it's just terrible for people to look at. His wife, some people think that she's just telling him to die, but maybe she's just having compassion on him, you know? In Job 2, 9-10, it says this, Then his wife said to him, Do you still hold fast to your integrity? Curse God and die. But he said to her, You speak as one of the foolish women speaks. Shall we indeed accept good from God, and shall we not accept adversity? In all this, Job did not sin with his lips. So maybe he was having, she was having compassion on him, and seeing him in his suffering, and realized that dying would be one way of getting rid of the pain. And then along come three of his good friends. At least they claimed to be his good friends. They'd heard about his grief and they came to comfort Job. Job 2, 11 through 13 says this, Now when Job's three friends heard of all this adversity that had come upon him, each one came from his own place. Eliphaz, the, the Temanite, Bildad, the Shurite, and Zophar, the Naphthonite, for they had made an agreement together to come and mourn with him and to comfort him. And you see the secret there? And to comfort him. And when they raised their eyes from afar and did not recognize him, they lifted their voices and wept. And each one tore his robe and sprinkled dust on his head towards heaven. So they sat down with him on the ground seven days and seven nights, and no one spoke a word to him. For they saw that his grief was very great. So they started out doing the right thing. When somebody is in a lot of pain, sometimes just sitting there with them is the right answer to do. You don't have to talk to them. You just be there as a comfort to them. And they did. They spent a whole week there with Job, just comfort to him. And after one week of sitting with their friend, Remaining in silence, Job finally speaks. And this is when the great discussion starts, isn't it? What does Job finally say? Here's a man in great sorrow and pain. His friends have been there a week sitting with him, just waiting for Job to speak. And a man in great pain and suffering, or a woman in great pain and suffering, sometimes this is the very words they say. May the day perish in which I was born, and the night in which it was said. That's Job 3.3. 3. In 3.11 he says, Why did I not die at birth? Why did I perish when I came from the wound? In 3.25 he says, For the thing I greatly feared has come upon me, and what I dreaded has happened to me me. Do these not sound like the pains of the words of somebody that's in suffering? That sometimes you just as soon wish you were dead than to have to go through all the suffering and pain? So you can deal with the loss of the property. And even at times, you can even deal with the loss of a, of a child or a loved one. But when it affects your health, it's really personal at that point, isn't it? This is what Philippians 1, 21 through 26 says. See, there's been more people 
in the Bible that have complained about wanting to die in their suffering and pain. Philippians 1, 22-26 says this, For to me to live is Christ, and to die is gain. Who said that? Paul said that while he was in prison. He said, But if I live on in the flesh, this will mean fruit from my labor, yet what I shall choose I cannot tell. For I am hard pressed between the two, having a desire to part and be with Christ, which is far better, Nevertheless, to remain in the flesh is more needful for you. And being confident of this, I know that I will remain and continue with you all for your progress and joy of faith, that your rejoicing for me may be more abundant in Jesus Christ by my coming to you again. So what is Paul saying? Basically, Paul saying, if I go and be with the Lord, it's good for me. I'm out of my misery, I'm out of my pain, I'm in the presence of the Lord. But if I stay, it's good for you, because now I get to teach you more of what God's Word is. And maybe that's what Job was there for. Job's desire, of course he wanted to end his suffering and pain. But he knew that he had more to live than just for that. You know, Philippians 1, 29 says, For to you it has been granted on behalf of Christ not only to believe in Him, but also to suffer for His sake, having the same conflict which you saw in me and now here in me. Does that necessarily mean you have something wrong to be in this situation, that you've done something wrong in this situation? No. It just means that maybe you have a greater purpose to feel that you don't understand on it. Even the prophet Jeremiah, when he was in his turmoil, he said this, Cursed be the day in which I was born. Let the day not be blessed in which my mother bore me. Let the man be cursed who brought news to my father, saying, A male child has been born to you, making him very glad. Here's another person, another prophet of God who because of his circumstance, would just as soon die to get through with the suffering and pain he went through. Or you remember Jonah? Even Jonah had the same situation. Remember, God told him to go to Nineveh, and what does he do? He runs away the opposite direction. God has to deal with him, sends him back to Nineveh, and in Nineveh he's preaching God's word, and the people are repenting. And what does Nineveh do? He goes on top of the hill. He's waiting to watch Nineveh be destroyed. He wants Nineveh to be destroyed. God creates, he builds a little shelter. God creates his plant to come over and cover the shelter to keep him in shade. And then the plant dies. Jonah chapter 4, 8 through 11 says this. And it happened when the sun arose that God prepared a vehement east wind and the sun beat on Jonah's head so that he grew faint. Then he wished death for himself and said, It is better for me to die than to live. Then God said to Jonah, Is it right for you to be angry about the plant? And he said, It is right for me to be angry even to death. But the Lord said, You have had pity on the plant for which you have not labored nor made it grow, which made, came up in a night and perished in a night. And should I not pity Nineveh, that great city in which are more than 120,000 persons who cannot discern between their right hand and their left and much live stock? Nineveh was looking forward, or Jonah was looking forward to Nineveh being destroyed. And God says, here you are complaining about dying because you're in the heat and you want Nineveh to be destroyed. He says, and I'm trying to save these people. Should you not have compassion on them? Remember what Revelation says in the end times? They're going through turmoil. These people want to die because of all the turmoil they're going through. They've rejected God. They won't turn back to Him. 
In Revelation 9, 3 through 6, it says, They were commanded not to harm the grass of the earth or any great thing or any tree, but only those men who do not have the seal of God on their foreheads. And they were not given authority to kill them, but to torment them for five months. Their torment was like the torment of a scorpion when it strikes a man. And in those days, men will seek death and will not find it. They will desire to die, and death will flee from them. Great agony and pain these people will be into, but every one of them will wish to die, but death will not come to them. As we go in and continue reading in the book of Job, we come to chapters 4 and 5, and his friend Eliphaz, Eliphaz starts to speak. And he starts to accuse Job that all this that happened to him was because of some sin that he did in his life. And God is punishing him for it. And how did he come to this situation? Well, he tells Job of a dream that he had. In Job chapter 4, 12 through 17, we get to read of his dream, and it goes like this. Now a word was secretly brought to me, and my ear received a whisper of it. In disquieting thoughts from the vision of the night, when deep sleep falls on men, fear came upon me and trembling, which made all my bones shake. Then a spirit passed before my face, the hair of my body stood up. It stood still, but I could not discern its appearance. A form was before my eyes. There was silence. Then I heard a voice saying, Can a mortal be more righteous than God? Can a man be more pure than his maker? And what do we know about Job? Job was a righteous man. So Eliphaz got this idea that Job has come to the impression that he is more righteous than God. Of course, we know that's not the case. So Eliphaz is telling Job, you need to repent of this. God's punishing for what you're doing there. Chapter 6, we read of Job's reply and explains his complaint that the suffering has gone through is a just complaint. Do we not take our concerns to God? When we have troubles, are we not told that we let give them to God? We do. And that's what Job was doing. He was taking his concerns and complaint to, the, to God. Psalms 55.22 says, Cast your burden on the Lord, and He shall sustain you. He will never permit the righteous to be moved. In other words, you take your burden that you have, the suffering that you're going through, you give it to the Lord and let Him deal with it. He may take it away. He may let you go through it. But in either case, He's going to hold you strong. In it. Philippians 4 says, 6 says this, Be anxious for nothing, but in everything by prayer and supplication with thanksgiving, let your requests be known to God. Again, he tells us to take our concerns to Him. And Job was doing the very same thing that God has asked us to do. Job 6 8 says this, Oh, that I might have my requests that God would grant me the thing that I long for. Now, maybe Job's request was not the right request, asking for his life to be taken so he could be put out of the suffering. Maybe God had a greater purpose for him. Job just could not see that. In Job 7 11, he says, Therefore, I will not restrain my mouth. I will speak in the anguish of my spirit. I will complain in the bitterness of my soul. The very thing that we do when we're suffering and in anguish. So along comes his son, his other friend, Bildad. 
And he too must agrees with Eliphaz that somehow or another Job has sinned. And he needs to repent of it. You know? Obviously, if God has destroyed your children, what it maybe it was something your children did that God is punishing you for. And Bilbad comes to the conclusion that if you are pure and upright, God wouldn't do this to you. Only those who have done wrong is God going to punish like he's punishing you. Well, is that true? Of course, the answer, of course, is false. God brings things upon us at times that we don't understand why or what happened. God does. He sees the big picture and what he's trying to accomplish. Sometimes we only see a little tiny bit of that picture that's going on. His ways are not our ways, and his thoughts are not our thoughts. Then, of course, Khan Long's his third friend, Zophar. And instead of comforting Job and kind of help him during his time of suffering, what does he do? He too accuses him and tells him he needs to repent. Obviously, he did something wrong in his life. Each of these times these people speak, they leave the impression that this good person, this righteous man named Job, you've done something wrong to make God come after you like this. Job's 12.13 says this, With men are wisdom and strength. He has counsel and understanding. Job 12.4 goes on and says this, I am mocked, I am one mocked by my friends who called on God and he answered him, the just and blameless who is ridicule, ridiculed. See, these people believed, his friends believed, there is no life after death. They believe that once you're done on this earth, your life is over with. So to them, there is no hope. They had nothing to be hopeful for. All they could see what was the immediate actions of what were happening right in front of them at this particular time. You know, they weren't suffering. They're, they, everything they'd done was good. But then they truly weren't following God either, were they? They were kind of being left alone. Satan's not going to attack you if you are not following God. He may give you a nice good life in the process. So that's what made these, guys, these three friends of his decide that somehow or another Job did something wrong. Something to happen. Job 13, 15 through 16 says this, Though he slay me, yet will I trust him. Job's telling him, doesn't matter what God has done, I'm still going to trust him. Obviously, this is okay. I don't understand it. Even so, I will defend my own ways before him. He will also be my salvation for a hypocrite, hypocrite could not come before him. See, his friends should have been giving him hope. Instead, there was no comfort they were giving him. They were just giving him more sorrow, weren't they? Tell him, well, you deserve what you're getting. Job 14, 14. Job says this, he says, If a man dies, shall he live again? All the days of my hard work I will wait till my change comes. See, Job truly believed that even if he died today, 
And in his suffering, that's what he wanted to do. He believed that someday God would bring him back. And he references to a tree as an example of what he was talking about. Because he says, if you take a tree and cut it off, and that tree looks like it's dead, and inside and the roots look like they're dead, but if you put water on it, what happens? It starts to sprout. He says, I believe that's what's going to happen to me. I believe someday God will raise me up again so I can be in his presence. He goes on and explains this to his friends. says, But as a mountain falls and crumbles away and as a rock is moved from its place, as water wears away stones and as torments wash away the soil of the earth, so you destroy the hope of man. You guys should be here comforting me. Instead, you're destroying me. We need to give hope to people, not discouragement. Job 16 through 5 says this, I've heard many such things. Miserable comforts are you all. Shall words of wind have an end? And what provides you that your answer? I also could speak as you do. If your sorrow were in my soul's place, I would heap up words against you. I could heap up words against you and shake my head at you. But I would strengthen you with my mouth and the comfort of my lips would relieve your grief. So if you're in the presence of someone suffering, you should be the one bringing them hope. You should be the one bringing them comfort. Job says, that's what I would do if, if the situation was turned around. I would come to try to comfort you and help you through this situation. Instead of trying to get you to convince that you did something wrong. See, Job continues his great insight to his friends. In Job 19, 23-29, he says, Oh, that my words were written, oh, that they were inscribed in a book, that they were engraved on a rock with an iron pin and lead forever. For I know that my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth, and after my skin is destroyed, this I know, that in my flesh I shall see God whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yarns within me. If you should say, how shall you persecute him, since the root of the matter is found in me? Be afraid of the sword for yourselves, for wrath brings the punishment of the sword, that you may know there is a judgment. Time and time again, Job is accused of doing something wrong. And that his suffering is the cause of that. Somehow or another, this has to be his fault, what's going on. When we get into chapter 24 of Job. Job goes and explains to his friends that the world is full of violence. And God still allows him to live and have a full life. Here's his people who don't know who God is, but yet God allows them to have a, a good life. Why? You know? Because it's not until after death are you going to be judged. Then you'll be asked, what did you do for me while you were on this earth? And he's trying to tell his friends that. Job 25, 4 says, How then can man be righteous before God? Or how can he be pure who is born of a woman? Job 28, 27 through 
20, 27 and 28 says this. This is what he tells his friends. He says, Then he saw wisdom and declared. He prepared it indeed. He searched it out. And to man he said, Behold, the fear of the Lord, that is wisdom, and to depart from evil is understanding. It says, If you want to know who the Lord is, then fear the Lord. And you will gain wisdom and understanding. And you'll know what evil is. In Job chapter 21, Job defends his righteousness. He explains to his friends that he hasn't done anything wrong. You know? If that's the case, God would deal with him on that issue. But that hasn't been the case, he says. I've been doing everything right. Job 31, 2 through 4 says, For what is the allotment of God from above, and the inheritance of the Almighty from on high? It is not destruction for the wicked or disaster for the workers of iniquity. Does he not see my ways and count all my steps? Does he not know the things I do every day? Finally, God has to come into the picture. Job has reached the point now where he figures that he's a righteous man, and he is, and that his righteousness is based upon himself. So if there's any sin that you would say Job did, maybe this is it. You know? God has to remind him that he's the one in charge of the universe. He's the one who allows evil to exist. And it will be judged in his timing. Not his friend's timing, not even Job's timing. And he is the one who can even test Job. Now Job comes to realize that he's a righteous man because of God. God's the one who declared him righteous. And of this he does repent. Well, his friends... They finally get a picture of who God is. See, they had come there to convince Job that they thought by convincing him he had sinned and he needs to repent of whatever wrong he'd done, that that would comfort him. And Job says, I did nothing wrong. Whatever this is, God has put it upon me and I'm going to go through it. We need to remember that too. Sometimes the things that happen to us in our life, we can't explain. But God can. He knows what he's doing. And in this case, when we look at what happened, what happened to Job? The suffering, the losses that he went through, the pain and agony he went through. And you ask yourself, what was it for? Maybe it is to reach his three friends and help him to realize who God was, who God is. Job 42, 7 through 8 says, And so it was after the Lord had spoken these words to Job that the Lord said to Eliphaz, the, the Temanite, My wrath is roused against you and your two friends, for you have not spoken of me what is right, as my servant Job has. Now therefore take for yourselves seven bowls and seven rams, go to my servant Job, and offer up for yourself a burnt offering, and my servant Job shall pray for you. For I will accept him, lest I deal with you according to your folly, 
because you have not spoken to me what is right as my servant Job has. So when we look from this, from our perspective, backwards, what do we see? First, we thought it was cruel that God would tell Satan to do this. But in reality, when it was over with, those three friends of his got to know who God was. And got to learn how to straighten out their lives to see God in the proper perspective. So see, we may be going through this to touch somebody else's life. And we don't even know it. What a blessing that is. Yeah, I still like when Job looks had made that first statement and he said, naked I came into the world and naked I will leave. He says, God's given me all these blessings. God can take all these blessings away from me. God has given me good health. He can take it away if he wants to. That's what we need to remember. But in all cases, we give praise and glory to God. Romans 8, 38-39 through 39 says this. It says, For I am persuaded that neither death, nor life, nor angels, nor principles, nor powers, nor things present, nor things to come, nor height, nor death, nor any other created thing will be, shall be able to separate us from the love of God, which is in Christ Jesus our Lord. So no matter what we're going through, if we know Jesus Christ as our Lord and Savior, no matter the situation, we know that God's love is still there for us. We may not understand what we're going through, but praise the Lord, He does, and we will give Him the praise and glory through it. Let's close in a word of prayer. Father, we do thank you, Lord. What a blessing it is to know that in spite of all that goes around us, it still has to pass through you. That nothing happens to us without your approval. We don't know the time you're going to call us home. We don't know the time when an accident's about to happen. We don't know any of that stuff. But you do. So we trust you. We put our lives in your hand, Lord. We ask you to guide and direct us, to protect us. And we may not understand the path that you put us on, but we know, Lord, it is a path that is that you have something destined through it. Through it all, these three friends got to see who God was. They got a better understanding through Job who God is. Lord, we ask the same thing, that when opportunity comes, we too can share your word with others. We think of Portland and Seattle and New York and Chicago and all these other cities that are going through so much so much turmoil. We pray, Lord, that somehow or another your word will reach them and they'll get a true understanding of, of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Thank you. Look forward to seeing you next week. Bye.